Hello guys, welcome back to another tutorial. Hit the bell icon button so that you don't miss out any tutorial. So let's talk about what a container is and why is it important and why do we want it? So containers are like many virtual machines in the respect that they have their own CPU and memory resources as well as hard drive resources. So while they have an isolated set of resources and there is an agent which acts a little bit like a hypervisor if you're familiar with virtual machines, they're not really virtual machines. So the way these containers handle creating this isolation is by using OS level routing for the network and lots of other tricks that make your application seem like it's in its own virtual machine where it uses the operating system to limit the calls that can happen to the hard drive outside of the area that it wants. And it creates lots of virtualized devices on the actual host operating system. However, things like the networking still need to go back through the host operating system and really don't travel past it in a truly hardware optimized way. So if you're going for more performance inside of a virtual world, containers are not necessarily gonna give you the top end performance where a virtual machine will give you the best bang for your buck right now. That said, they do use processor virtualization features to create some of this isolation. However, they use them primarily through the operating system. There are several types of containers out there. However, in this world, Docker is the overwhelming favorite right now. So for this course, we'll be sticking to Docker and technologies that work with Docker, like Kubernetes. With Docker's popularity, your stuff is much more portable. Google, AWS, and Microsoft all offer first-tier Docker support. This makes your Docker application very portable between various different cloud providers. So before we move on to looking at Docker, we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of containers and why you want to use them and really what they bring to the table. A lot of these benefits used to be very, very expensive and the domain of commercial products only. But in today's ecosystem, you can get first tier deployability out of a container. Now, what is deployability? Deployability means that you take something that has been developed or been developed by someone else and put it onto the server very easily. All you have to do is provision an instance and stick the container on there, and suddenly your application is out there and ready to rock and roll. In the upcoming lab, we'll take a look at something that we build on our local machine and simply upload to the server and then turn it on and we're automatically done after only provisioning a single compute instance. In fact, if you think back to the compute video that we did earlier, there was a little checkbox in there that said that we wanted to deploy a container. So we'll actually be doing that and creating our own account inside of Docker so that we can deploy our own images. The next giant benefit to containers is the reusability that you get out of them. So let's say you have an application that needs to go to 10,000 customers. Well, if you deploy it as a container and allow them to utilize it, the, when they start to upgrade, everybody gets the same container, meaning it was reused by everyone. So you built it once and all of your customers were able to get it. And because you're controlling more at an operating system level than just a software level, you can perform things like OS migrations that install new things. For instance, let's imagine that you were running a software program that was based on Python 2. And Python 2's support is ending in 2020. So you've made an update and it now relies on Python 3. So now that you have your application all set up and ready to go, you can deploy it. And instead of in counting on people to install the correct version of Python to run your software, you can have the container declare that it needs Python 3 and it'll automatically be installed and put into the correct place where you can reliably use it inside of your container. This level of reusability leads straight to our next benefit, which is portability, meaning you can move this wherever you want. In fact, 
we'll be looking at an example inside of our lab where I build a container on my local Windows machine, compile it, push it up to the Docker system, and then install it on Linux on a Google Compute virtual machine. And nothing had changed all the way from my Windows machine all the way into the cloud. Since containers are a lot of fun to look at and not so much fun to talk about in a PowerPoint presentation, we'll go through this one pretty quickly. Because in the last one, we talked about a lot of the concepts that are global to all types of containers. But Docker is the gold standard of open source containers out there. For those of you that like a little more enterprise grade support, there's also an enterprise version available. So if you want someone else to help you out with your problems when there is issues with your Docker container, this enterprise version is an outstanding way to go. Some of the other things that the enterprise version offers is the ability to put it behind a load balancer a lot easier. There's a lot of ways to go about scaling Docker, and we're actually going to be talking about one of them, which is Kubernetes. And in the cloud, there is a lot of different ways to handle uh, routing your traffic from the internet to Kubernetes and then eventually to Docker. But those things can be more difficult to do on a hardware environment. So the enterprise version might be a more appropriate version for you in hardware-based environments as opposed to cloud-based environments. So the enterprise version really adds many large scaling features and it's not required, but a nice to have if you want the support. So Dockers are built up, as you might imagine, out of containers. So what is a container? A container tells the operating system what it needs. So a container defines itself by the requirements that it has from the operating system and installed software and can even go as far as to say it needs certain amounts of memory or CPU power to effectively operate. It will also define an entry point, just like most coding does. So after the container is finished starting, what happens? Does it run something, or is it waiting for someone to log in and use it for something else? When you run a container, you're going to want to map the ports to the outside world if you need to have inbound internet access. So let's say your container is a web server. Mapping ports into it would be a must. However, let's say it was a processor of data that crunched a whole bunch of numbers every night at midnight, then it doesn't need any connection to the outside world, assuming that it's only accessing cloud-based resources. Let's briefly talk about some of the use cases that it's good for. So the first one is development environments. And development environments can become very complex in certain circumstances, yet you still need everybody to be on the same page. And instead of managing this with lots of communication and buggy human-based processes, creating a Docker file and deploying it as your entire development environment can allow developers to all stay on the same page. Imagine 20 developers all needing a complex ML environment that is running complex training and takes hours and hours to set up and every time you make an update takes hours and hours to update. Just by having it in a Docker container where everybody can download the new version after they've committed their files to say a Git repository, your development environment is completely updated within minutes. Now let's take this extremely complex environment and put it on the server. The same file that you use to move your development environment around might also be very appropriate to just put onto the server. If it isn't, a lot of the stuff that you've created inside of your first Docker container can be reused inside of your second Docker container. Another awesome thing about Docker is that it just scales. You can use things like Kubernetes or Amazon's ECS to scale these things up. So we'll be looking at Kubernetes since that that is the open source kind of paired project, sister project if you will, to Docker and inside of the whole Google ecosystem they've 
leaned towards Kubernetes as their orchestration engine. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the Kubernetes video. The next awesome use case for them is one-off servers, or at least that's what I call them. These are the servers that get built internally to handle that one thing that doesn't really fit with any of your products. This is a nice way of encapsulating it and just throwing it onto kind of a catch-all server. And if you do have one of these catch-all servers, isolation is going to be really awesome. Isolation allows you to run your servers knowing that if they totally self-destruct, they're not going to be taking down other servers with them. So with these types of one-off servers, one amazing thing is isolation. So imagine that you had something that really didn't go through the same level of quality assurance as your production systems, but you still want to run it in a place where it is a production environment. You can isolate any damage it might do in a unknown use case by putting it into a Docker container. Now, clearly these aren't ideal circumstances, but as we know, in the real world, we're not going to get to deal with all ideal circumstances. So isolation is very important for server stability and durability. Another use case I like to use Docker for is recurring tasks. For instance, let's say over the course of the day, a bunch of people upload photos to your website, and then at the end of the day, you want to process them all. This recurring task could be built into a Docker container. The Docker container could be loaded, and then if it runs for 30 minutes or three hours, it doesn't matter because then you can just gobble up the resources after you're done and reprovision the environment again the next midnight. So as that process grows, you'll just update your Docker container, and all of a sudden your recurring tasks are already updated. Testing is another area where Docker really shines. Because it's so portable and easy to move around, you can often deploy a very identical version in your quality assurance environment that is in your production environment. And as we know, anything that you can do to mirror your production environment to your QA environment will help expose the most bugs during your testing. Overall, it's just really good at simplifying the creation of complex environments for others. Whether or not that's testing, development, some kind of crazy AI project, it doesn't really matter. Docker simplifies things, even if you're installing it down on a little tiny Raspberry Pi or something very small. So as you can see, I've run out of space to add more use cases. But as you can see, Docker is very, very flexible. So instead of just talking about all of the different use cases that we could use it for, let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at a project that we'll be doing later on inside of a lab. I'll show you kind of it in its end form and what we'll be doing. And then we'll go ahead and in the lab, we'll do it together and take it step by step. So before I go any further on this, I wanna tell you that I've already installed Docker. And the Docker install is pretty straightforward. Sometimes you have to change some pretty advanced settings to get it set up correctly. However, Docker's documentation is fantastic. And when the errors occur, it will generally link you to the documentation right from the error in the console. So if by chance you are following along at this point and you're running some of these commands and they don't work, go ahead and look at some of the troubleshooting guides that come with Docker. They're very complete and very well written. So there's a few commands here and I'm going to show you what I'm going to be doing later on inside of the lab with you guys. So Google has a project that you can actually just download from GitHub. It's called Cheers 2019. So this is the project I'll be showing you and we'll be using in the lab. It's straight from Docker themselves and it's a little doodle that they put inside that basically has a nice little animation to it. And then we'll go ahead and take this, and even though it's more of a desktop application, we will go ahead and move it into the cloud as a Docker container, and we'll create our own Docker account to do that. So I've already done that, but I kinda wanna show you how this all works and why it's so cool. The other thing I'm going to include in here for you is this quick start guide. It'll be down below in the resources. It's straight from Google and it helps you get Docker set up and it also helps you get it set up so that it'll work with the Google Cloud Platform seamlessly. So running Docker with 
the set of directions from Docker is also just fine. You don't have to install it this way. This will just have you install some additional things, some of which you've already done, like the Google Cloud SDK. So I'll be using Windows PowerShell, as I said, to control Docker. And all of these commands can be run on Linux or Mac with the exact same uh, command. The, none of this stuff is proprietary to any operating system whatsoever. The way they handle it behind the scenes is very different, but, you know, in the front, very much the same. So I'm going to run the command docker images, and this is going to list out the images that are on my local machine. Now, another command I'm going to run is docker ps. This shows me the processes that are running on this machine at the current time. And as you can see, I don't have any. But when I do run them, there's going to be some important information here. First, we have the container ID, which is going to be a ID that's assigned at runtime. And then that is going to allow you to run specific commands on a specific running container. The next one is the image. It's the image from this list of images that we have on our system that's running. So for instance, I'm going to run Greg Harrington slash Cheers 2019, which is that open source project from Docker I showed you. And we're going to see it is running under Docker PS here in a moment. And the specific image will be that while it has a container ID that's some kind of gobbledygook. If it's got startup commands, they'll appear here. The time it was created will appear here. The current status of it will appear here. The web ports that are mapped back and forth, or rather I should say network ports, will be here. And any other additional names for the container will appear over here. So I've already downloaded, installed the code. So I already have an image here that's ready to go that's going to be easy to run. And the way we run it is docker run dash it, which means I is for interactive and I want to connect to it. So basically what this part of the command says is once it's run, I want to actually connect to it and have a terminal, which is what the T stands for. The next one I'm going to put in there is dash dash rm. This is a nice convenience command, especially on development machines. When you run Docker, it takes a lot of hard drive space to set up what is essentially a virtual operating system. The dash dash RM will allow us to clean up those resources when we're done with this Docker container and we stop it from running. So this is more of a development side command. And on the server, you may also have some use for it, but you more often on the server will care about performance so cleaning up the resources won't necessarily be a good thing and if you are doing any kind of file creation as the result of your docker container and you want those files to stick around after it's run this will not be a good command for that and then finally i need to type in the image name that i want to run which is my name greg harrington and then slash then cheers 2019. So Greg Harrington is the name of my account on Docker. And then cheers is the name of the published, or cheers 2019 is the name of the published product, project. So if you look up here at say TensorFlow, which is an AI project, the company is TensorFlow, which is also Google actually. And then the product is also named TensorFlow, but I have checked out a specific tag in these cases. So I actually have multiple different versions of this Docker container I can run. And in this case, I only have the one. So it'll automatically run the latest unless you specify one of these other tags. All right, so let's go ahead and hit enter. Now, what we should see is that it's going to create one of these containers, and then it's going to run a file inside of it. And this file happens to be written in the Google language, Go, and it's going to display a uh, animation written in text only. And it's uh, basically a New Year's 2019 cheers. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. 
and you'll see that there's the docker whale. If you're not familiar, uh, the whale is uh, the logo for the Docker community. The idea is that it's like a container ship, and these are the containers on top. And this is written in Go, which is a language I've never even worked in. So that just shows you how easy it is to run something that's in Docker. I never have even seen this file, and all I did is check it out and run it. And there you go, I have a whole operating system set up with a language I've never used, and it's running a program I never wrote. And then I'll go ahead and hit escape. And if I run Docker PS now, we'll see that the image has already gone away. Now, if I were to run other commands, it would be listed here. And we'll get into that a little bit more inside of the lab that's coming up. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you like the video, do give us a thumbs up and share it. Also check out amazing discounts and offers on our premium courses in the description below.